team part B this week. Good news, you don't have a free lot to write. You already wrote that last week. Um, you'll have a quiz this week. Make sure you bring your calculators down here. Bring your calculators each week. Bring your calculators. Um, experiment 16 and 18 um, are due this week. Um, and in the back here, I've got experiment 20 part B, the revised version of what is in your lab manual. Because what is, your lab, is in your lab manual won't work very well because you didn't do 20A. So next week we're going to do 20 part B. Um, you'll get your technician assignment from your laptop in a minute here. I'll explain what that means. And in three weeks, experiment 17 report is due. Um, one note about tomorrow's quiz. Um, so far, what we've learned about NMR could be any, on any quiz, um, especially this one. Okay, so make sure that you will understand all the NMR we've covered as well as what's been covered in lecture up to this point for, for the quiz this week. Okay, um, now as far as technician assignment, what that means for um, experiment 20 is in your lab manual at the intro of experiment 20, there is this list of technician assignments. Okay. Um, since we're not doing part A, because we already missed a week of lab, um, then you're going to be doing part B and C. We are going to be making, um, we are going to be starting with the 4-methyl hydroxybenzoate that could have been made in part A, okay? So where it says, and I'll explain these R groups next week in more detail, but where it says R equal methyl, those, that's the only part of that table we're going to use, okay? So find out from your lab prof this week what your technician assignment is. It's either, it's one of one through six, okay? From that, you will find out which acid chloride that you're going to use. So you can read ahead in 20 part B or next week I'll explain this part but you need to know what acid chloride you're using for 20B so you can write the appropriate pre-lab for it, okay? And you'll write a pre-lab for 20B and a separate pre-lab for 20C because they're really two completely, two separate reactions, okay? But just so you know, look for this table in your lab manual. We're only going to be doing one through six and find out what your number is one through six this week in the lab, okay? All right. So I'm going to start with today, we're going to talk about column chromatography. So yet another chromatography, <coughs> we've covered so many. This is a good technique for um, purifying a compound, but what you will get back out of it is you'll get your compound back out of it. So, so far we've talked about gel permeation chromatography, um, gas chromatography, thin layer chromatography, all of those you use sample for, but you're not getting your sample back out of it. This technique we're going to use to purify your crude mixture from last week, and you'll get a purified mixture hopefully out of the process in the end, okay? Um, this is also known as elution chromatography. And this separation is based on polarity. So what is this most like then? It's most like TLC, and I'll explain to you um, how it is very similar to TLC, and you'll use TLC with this, okay? So we've got column chromatography, it's used, it's um, separation is based on polarity, just like um, thin layer chromatography. Um, we always have with chromatography, what are the two things you always have? Stationary. stationary phase and mobile phase, right? Okay, so our stationary phase. is some sort of um, solid adsorbent, so your compound is going to be not absorbed, but adsorbed. 
and it's usually either silica or alumina when you're talking about um, column chromatography. So our other phase is the mobile phase, right? And that is our, whatever our solvent is, or just like with thin layer chromatography, the solvent is also the eluent. They mean the same thing. And more often than not, you'll hear eluent instead of your solvent. Okay? <coughs> so um, there's a couple different types of chromatography columns that can be used. This figure is out of your lab manual. What you'll be using in lab this week is most like the one on the left. Um, so we've got ours is instead of usually they're glass columns, ours are plastic um, and they're little tiny little columns. Um, and usually they get much bigger than that. Um, so you have this um, column that's of the same diameter across. On the bottom, right before the stopcock, you have this glass frit in the bottom of that column, and then you have a stopcock, okay? Um, then you fill the column with the adsorbent and whatever eluent you're using, and then you'll drain it out of the bottom with this stopcock, okay? If you don't have the glass frit, so the columns you're using do, if you don't have the glass frit, what you need to do is you put a little bit of glass wool or cotton here in the bottom of the column, and then you fill it with a layer of sand, and that works just like the glass frit, and then you fill up the adsorbent and the solvent. So this layer of sand or the glass frit is just there to hold the silica or alumina in place so it doesn't drain through with the column that you're trying, or with the fractions you're trying to collect, okay? Um, now with TLC, or with column chromatography, <coughs> you're going to analyze the fractions that you're going to collect with TLC. So you're not going to collect Um, all of, you're not going to collect everything that comes off of the column all at once. You now want to divvy it up into smaller pieces, smaller fractions, so that you can get things purified. And then we'll use thin layer chromatography to <coughs> analyze it. And so the way that a column works, it's kind of like an upside down TLC plate. So what what type of compounds would come off of a TLC plate or have the highest, travel the farthest up a TLC plate? The more, the more non-polar compounds, right? They absorb less to the silica. So the non-polar compounds have a higher RF, they're traveling farther up the TLC plate. With column chromatography, your, your non-polar compounds are going to come off of the column first. They're going to be in your early fractions. So if you think of the TLC plate and you flip it over, what's coming down first is going to be what comes off of the column first. And so then the more nonpolar compounds will come off later off of the column. Okay? So, or sorry, the more polar compounds will come off later. So nonpolar compounds elute first. followed by more po polar compounds. <coughs> and um, depending on the relative polarity of these compounds, you would determine whether you would use silica or alumina. So for the most part, we're always going to be using silica. Um, so SiO2, silicon dioxide. Um, that works well for um, fairly polar organic compounds or a mixture that involves um, fairly <coughs> polar organic compounds. The other thing that you could use is alumina. And that adsorbs organic compounds more than silica, so it's said to be more active, and so that's good at 
separating, if you want your nonpolar compounds to stick to you and your adsorbent more, that's better for nonpolar compounds versus polar compounds that already stick pretty well, and then they'll stick so well you can't get them off. Okay. So um, we're this week going to be using silica. Um, more, more times than not, any separation you're going to use for an organic compound is usually going to be silica unless special cases you would use alumina. Okay. Um, now besides the adsorbent, we need to think about our eluent that we're using and what would be the um, best thing to use. So in your lab manual, I also have a list of common um, <coughs> solvents that are used for, or solvent mixtures that are used for column chromatography, okay? And they are listed in increasing eluting power, <coughs> meaning going from nonpolar to more polar, because remember, nonpolar eluents make things travel not as far on a TLC plate. That also means they don't elute as quickly from a column, okay? Um, more polar compounds will travel farther up a TLC plate and you'll elute more from the um, column itself, okay? Um, so if you think about this, really polar compounds aren't going to elute very well in a nonpolar solvent. And really, um, nonpolar compounds aren't, are going to elute in the polar solvent, but you're not going to get good separation, okay? So you've got Polar compounds won't move very much if it's too, too nonpolar. Nonpolar compounds will move really quickly, but you won't get any separation. So what you want is that in between. So usually for column chromatography, you're using some sort of solvent that has the mixture itself gives it kind of an in-between polarity, and you're using something relatively nonpolar and a more polar solvent for that combination. Okay. And so that's why for this week we're using hexane and ethyl acetate. We're using a mixture of them. And that way too, in using that mixture, you can um, change your ratio in that mixture if you need to, um, to make things loop more quickly or make things loop more slowly, depending on what your separation looks like. Okay, so you want that. Usually you're aiming for that kind of in-between that has a mixture of nonpolar and a more polar solid. Okay? <coughs> Um, now, we're going to, this week, teach you how to put everything together for our column chromatography, okay? Um, so we're going to start with, we're going to have our column that doesn't have anything in it, and then we're going to, our column is going to already, like I said, have the glass print on the bottom. So you're going to start by <coughs> what is called slurry packing the column. And so what we're going to do is take our eluent and we're going to take a portion of silica and you're going to mix the silica, which is a solid, in that eluent and you make this slurry. Then you're going to put the slurry onto the column. Okay. Um, once you put the slurry onto the column, you're going to drain the eluent to help pack the column. So in the end, what you want is this column that has the slurry of silica in it that's in a homogeneous mixture. Okay, you want it all as uniform as possible because your separation is going to take place on that silica that is the slurry mixture. So um, you want to make sure you get rid of the air bubbles. <coughs> you want the um, top of the silica And you want the whole um, slurry through that column to be as uniform as possible. Okay. 
So once you have packed the column, and again, I'll show, like I said, we'll show you how to do this in lab, you want to make sure you don't disturb the silica at all, okay? So you never, once you've got it packed, you don't want to let the solvent of the, your eluent drain below the level of the silica in the column once you pack the column, okay? If you do that, what you're going to get are cracks and air bubbles in the silica, and that's going to prevent or hinder your separation, so you're not going to get a very good separation with, with the column, okay? So be really careful with the packing process, and then be really careful once you're done packing your column not to let the solvent drain below the level of the silica, okay? So that's kind of the first portion here um, of this overhead and these steps that are in your lab manual. Then once you get um, your column packed, then you're going to drain the um, eluent level to right above the silica, but not drop below it, okay? So you're going to keep it right above. Then you're going to add a, a solution of your sample that you're trying to separate right on top of that silica, okay? And again, you've got to be really careful. We've got this nice packed silica. We don't want to drain or we don't want to disturb the top of the silica. So when you're adding your um, sample on there, you want to make sure not to put divots in it with the pipette. You gotta, you're going to drain it around the sides of the column, not drop it straight on. Um, and be very careful getting it onto the column, okay? And so that putting on this, the sample onto the column is what we call loading your sample, okay? Once you get your sample loaded onto the column, then you're going to very carefully, and as you load your sample, you're going to drain a little out of the bottom, maybe put another rinse on there, drain a little bit out of the bottom, make sure everything's good and adhered to that silica. Then once you've done that, then you're going to add your eluent on top of the, the um, silica and then start collecting fractions, okay? Um, you want to make sure that your product or your sample is adhered to that silica before you add a big bulky um, amount of the eluent because otherwise your sample, instead of being dissolved in a tiny little bit of eluent, will end up partially dissolved in a big um, volume of eluent and that'll make it so you, it doesn't separate. What'll happen is your, your um, sample will just streak through the column instead of coming off in sections, in fractions, okay? So then, solvents on the column. Then you can decide if you want to use your separatory funnel or not. This example shows you, you can put eluent into the separatory funnel and then drip it onto the column. You kind of have to make it so that the, what drips onto the column is dripping at the same rate as what is dripping off of the column as you're collecting fractions. Um, so it's up to you if you want to do that or just add eluent when you need to so you don't go below um, the silica line. Um, and then you're going to start collecting fractions from the column, okay? So the last kind of steps here are um, adding eluent. And then we start collecting fractions. this column, you're going to collect your fractions in small vials. So the 7 milliliter vials is what you're going to use for collecting your, your fractions. And you're going to fill them about a half to two-thirds full with each fraction. So once you get one vial filled a half to two thirds full, then you're gonna carefully, kind of takes uh, a little bit of coordination to take one vial off and keep the other 
and then put the next vial underneath it, and you can keep things dripping as long as you haven't run out of eluent. Otherwise, there are stopcocks on your columns. You can stop it from draining and then put the next vial underneath it. But it's going to be more quick to keep things draining as you're changing fractions. Just keep mindful of where your eluent um, volume is. So you probably want about 10 to 12 or so vials clean and dry before you set up your column. in these vials. Then you, you need to figure out what is in those fractions. So what are you going to use to figure out what's in the fraction? This is where we're going to use TLC, but we're going to do something we haven't done before yet with TLC. What I'm going to have you guys do is make what we call a grid TLC plate. Okay, So you're going to take a TLC plate and then just divide it into sections. And you're going to spot each of your fractions in a square. So fraction one, fraction two, fraction three, fraction four, so on and so forth. Just spot it, just a little bit of each fraction. And then you're going to look at the fractions under UV light and see what is UV active and what isn't UV active. Okay? And so what is UV active could potentially contain product what doesn't have any UV active spots, so you don't see anything under the UV light, then doesn't contain your product because your product is a UV active compound. Okay? Now, the fractions that contain UV active compounds do not mean they contain product. They just contain, contain something that's UV active. So then what you're going to do is then spot a regular TLC plate, and you're going to still use your standards from last week on the TLC plate, so put each of your standards on there, and then say fractions 2, 3, and 4 were UV active, then you would spot those on that TLC plate and then develop this TLC plate, okay? So the grid TLC plate is not going to be developed, you're just going to spot on it, look under the UV app lamp, see what's UV active. Then you'll make a regular TLC plate um, spot it with the fractions that are UV active, develop this in the eluent, and then once you develop it, you'll figure out what has product in it and what <coughs> doesn't. So that's why you're using your um, reactant standard and your product standard so you know what is what. Okay, so does everybody understand that? And you may not be able to get all of the fractions that are UV active on one TLC plate, so you'll have to develop a few TLC plates. Um, then once you've developed the TLC plates, you have to decide what fractions to combine. <coughs> TLC plate, once you develop it, we've got our reactant standard that's kind of down here. We've got this mixture that's got maybe something like that, a product, and then you've got another one here, and then you've got this one that has a little bit of product in it but then it's starting to get some of the um, starting material in there or some impurities in there, okay? So then you have to decide, do I just keep um, fractions two and three, or do I combine fractions two, three, and four, four and introduce this impurity now into those fractions? So you have to decide what you're going to do. Ideally, you want your fractions as clean as possible and only containing product in there and not any um, other impurities, okay? But if you don't have um, a lot, if you only have a fraction or two, you may decide you need to add another <coughs> fraction to it. So you have to kind of decide what you're going to do once you look at these fractions as to what's being combined or not. 
If you're not sure what to do, ask your instructor before you continue on. Because the worst thing is you combine the product and the impurities back together again, and then it's basically like you haven't run the column, okay? Because if you throw the impurities back in there, you haven't done anything to separate things out, okay? So you'll have to, once you develop the TLC plates, decide what you're going to do as far as what you're keeping and what you're not, okay? So then, um, fractions to be keep, kept, you're going to rotavap them. So you're not going to have a whole lot. So remember like last week when I said every time you go to rotavap, the flask that you're going to rotavap in, know the tear weight. Know the tear weight because you're not going to have a whole lot in there and you don't want to transfer this product to something else to get the mass so you can have a yield for your final um, final reaction and isolation, okay, and purification because you do need the yield. So make sure you have the tear weight of the flask. Um, then what we're going to do is, so you use the rotavap last week, this week we're also going to use the high vacuum pump. And so what this does is it removes the residual solvent that you couldn't completely get off with the rotavap. So the rotavap does a really good job of getting most of the solvent off. Um, the high vacuum pump, you're going to put your um, compound then on the high vacuum pump and the instructors and TAs will help you with this to then pump off the rest of that solvent that you can't get off just from the rotavap, okay? And you, it may not seem like you have any there, but remember NMR, you're going to analyze this product with NMR. NMR is a very sensitive um, way of analyzing a compound. So if there's a little bit of solvent in it, you're going to see it in your NMR spectrum, okay? And in a minute here, I'm gonna go through the analysis of the NMR spectrum for 17. You'll see that you really don't want any impurities in there because it's complicated enough without extra stuff in there. So you wanna remove as much um, solvent as possible. So use the high vacuum pump. Then what you're going to want to do is make sure you calculate your yield. <coughs> then you're going to prepare your NMR sample. So you're going to need one drop of product. In a lot of cases, that may be all you have left. Okay, so you need one drop of product in five centimeters of CDCL3. We're using the same NMR solvent as we did for experiment 18, okay? So that's why you wanna get your yield first, then make your NMR sample. This is the only two things you have to do with your product once you get it, is get your yield, then make the NMR sample, all right? So if you only have one drop, that's fine, that's all you need, all right? Now, your NMR tubes need to be cleaned out and dried, okay? So if you didn't clean out your NMR tube last week, you need to rinse it out with acetone into organic waste, and then you need to dry it in the oven, inverted, for at least an hour to make sure you get all the acetone out of there and all the water out of there. And again, I would definitely go for the hour, not cut it short, because you don't want extra peaks in your NMR, all right? So make sure that you do a good job getting your NMR tube um, dried out. And it goes in down into the beaker in the oven so that it will dry out completely, okay? Um, no plastic caps in the oven, okay? Um, and then you'll submit your NMR sample just like you did for experiment 18. You'll have the sample block, you fill out the sheet next to it, you put the little tag on it, and then we'll um, run your samples this, this week as soon as we can, okay? And we'll let you know when we're done with them. Um, but do be careful to make sure everything is dried out and you get all the water out, okay? Um, <coughs> Now, once you are done with um, your column, you know, save your round bottom that has your um, 
sample in it. Now, one thing you may not want to do is use your 50 milliliter round body flask. That's what you need for 20 bead. Okay, so you may want to not use that for rotavaping. Use another bottom. Um, but save the product in the RB flask until you get your. Make sure that your NMR data has been collected and you can process your data. Um, you're going to clean out the vials and return those. So all organic waste goes in organic waste. And then return those back to the vial boxes in the lab for the next group to use. Um, now your column, we need to do something with it, OK? So when you're done using your column, drain all the eluent out of it, OK? So when you're sure you've collected all your fractions, just open the stop talk over a beaker or Erlenmeyer flask, drain all the eluent out of it, all right? Get it as drained and dried out as possible in the hood. And then you need to um, transfer the silica waste or the silica to the silica waste container in the reagent hood, okay? And any other residual silica, like in the beaker you made the slurry in, anything like that, once it's dried out, put that silica um, in the silica waste container in the raven hood. Do not put any solvent in the silica waste. We want just dry silica so we can finish airing it out and package it up um, as waste. So don't put any eluent in this container because then it won't dry out very well. Then we have to filter the silica waste instead of just letting it air out a little bit, okay? So no eluent in the silica waste container. You just need to tap out the silica out of your column. Um, if you need help doing so, we can help, help you get it out. Don't use your spatula in your column because that'll poke the glass frit, so you don't want to um, break the gla glass frit. And then get as much silica out as possible, and then you can rinse your um, column with a little bit of ac or a little bit of either hexane or ethyl acetate to get residual out of there and then put it in the used column pile in the hood. Okay, so there in the region hood you'll have new columns and used ones. Make sure the column you've used goes in the used one, not in the new one. All right? So it can be dried out for the next next class. Okay. Um, and then once you have all your data and you've cleaned up everything, you're set for this week. Um, all your TLC plates that you collect, grid TLC plate as well as developed TLC plates, those should go into your notebook. So either if your lab prof is having you trace them in, trace them into your notebook and get all your RF values um, measured, or if your lab prof is having you tape them in your notebook, then tape them all into your notebook and get all the measurements. Okay, But all that data, all of the TLC plates that you collect, <coughs> including the grid, grid TLC plate, should go into your notebook. Okay, questions with any of this? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is go over the um, processing of your NMR data and what you're trying to do with the processing and analysis of your Experiment 17 NMR data. Are referring to cis, you draw this product 
and trans, you draw this product, okay? We're going to be talking about HA cis and HB cis and HA trans and HB trans. So don't label these protons anything different than A and B and label them like they're labeled in this figure, okay? Because the way you're going to analyze things needs this convention, all right? Otherwise, we're going to be confused about what you're talking about if you're not using the same convention as us, okay? So follow that convention from 17.6. Um, this is the table we're going to need here in a minute. We're going to have to calculate some chemical shifts. So you're going to get your NMR data. You're going to need to figure out where things are in your NMR data and then analyze them to figure out whether you've got um, cis protons or trans protons, what compound they correspond to. So the first thing you're going to need to do to analyze this data is here's our um, cis compound again. Um, So we need to calculate um, the chemical shifts of our HA for the cis compound and the HB for the cis compound. So we're going to use our equation for calculating um, chemical shifts for protons around a double bond that is from experiment 16. So this is all the same tables that are in experiment 16. And we use the same calculations as before. So we're going to, using that table up there, First of all, for our HB cis, we'll start with 5.25, um, and then we're going to add to it our gem um, proton. So we're looking at HB. We're talking about what is gem to it. So here's our um, two methylenes attached to the um, aromatic ring. We're going to treat this like an alkyl group. So we'll add 0.44 to it, so if you look up on the table, we're adding 0.44. Then we're looking at what is cis to this compound, or to this proton, and that is another proton, so we add zero for that. And then we are looking at what's trans to HB, and that is our ester group, and so we use the ester group from our table, and we're going to add um, 0.56 for that ester group. So in the end, the calculated chemical shift for HB cis is 6.25. Okay. HA cis, we're going to go through the same calculation. Okay. So 5.25 plus what is gem to HA, the ester group, plus what is cis HB, plus um, what is trans is our alkyl group, and we come up with 5.80 for the calculated chemical shift for HA cis. Okay. <coughs> We're going to go through the same calculation again then for um, the trans compound. So HB trans 5.25 plus still has the same um, substituent gem to it, 0.44, plus then what is cis to it is the ester 1.15 and then HA is trans. So we come up with 6.84. And then for HA trans, going through the calculation, we come up with 5.84, okay? So in the end, our HB cis, our HB trans, 6.25, 6.84, there's a little bit of difference there. HA cis, HA trans, 5.80 and 5.84, not a whole lot of difference, okay? So we can't use just calculated chemical shift to figure out who they are, the HAs. Right. We can use the chemical shift for the HBs. So then the other thing we have to consider put this up over here is we've got protons around a double bond. So we're going to have coupling constants that we can also calculate. And here's our table from experiment 16 for <laughs> those coupling constants. So if we look at
first our um, cis compound, and here's our coupling, our calculated chemical shifts we came up with. If we draw splitting trees for HA cis, we're first going to have this and all cis splitting due to HB, so that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 12 hertz. And then we don't have a proton that's vanillic to HA, so we don't have a proton directly off this carbon on the other side, but we do have allylic protons, these protons here, off the first methylene connected to this carbon. And so the allylic coupling is 0 to 3 hertz off of that table. We've got two protons, so you've got coupling once, coupling twice, so in the end what you should have is a doublet of triplets for HA cis. Okay. Now if we look at HB, again we've got the cis coupling to HA, but then HB doesn't have a proton that's allylic to HB, we have a proton that's vanillic, so the methylenes are in the vanillic position relative to HB. And again, you've got two protons, split once, split twice, due to each proton, and you've got six to eight hertz coupling from those protons. So those peaks are going to be closer together, but again, you're going to have a doublet of triplets. Okay. Now if we look at the trans compound, so HA trans, our first vicinal trans um, coupling is going to be 12 to 18 hertz from HB. And then again, you still have allylic coupling, not vanillic coupling, so again, 0 to 3 hertz, same two protons, split once, split twice, so again, doublet of triplets, but our coupling constants are different between trans and cis, okay? So the initial coupling, the H12 hertz, is different than the 12 to 18 hertz. You can calculate that and find a different coupling constant. HB trans, again, we have trans relationship between HA and HB, so our splitting here, our coupling here is um, 12 to 18 hertz, and HB does not have any allylic protons, but again does have um, vanillic protons that have a coupling of 6 to 8 hertz. So again, doublet of triplets, so we've got splitting once, splitting twice, um, for HB. Okay? And just like with HA, you can see the difference in the coupling between cis and trans. Not vi the vicinal coupling, but just the cis and trans coupling. So HA, how can you tell the difference between the HA protons, HA cis and HA trans? <coughs> By coupling constant, right? Because the cal calculated chemical shifts are pretty much the same. What about um, HB protons, cis and trans? How can you tell them the difference? Tell the difference. Both chemical shift and chemical shift. Chemical shift and um, coupling constant are both different. Okay. All right. So before you start the analysis, this is part <laughs> of what. Um, on the last few pages of experiment 17, there's a whole section for this NMR analysis. First things you're going to have to do are calculate chemical shifts for HA and HB, cis and trans, and show the splitting trees for HA and HB. Then, we're going to first look at what these look like as far as NMR data, and then we'll look at the whole spectrum. So if we look at just our HB protons, remember they were fairly separated in um, <coughs> chemical shifts, so you can see them uniquely. HB trans is further downfield, HB cis is further upfield. Remember with a chemical shift, this is one signal for one proton, okay? So you, the chemical shift of this is right down the middle of this signal, all right? So that's the the chemical shift you report for HB, and then the shift right down the center is the chemical shift you would report for, H, um, for HB trans and then HB cis, okay? 
once you have your NMR data, you're going to want to, and you can probably fit this on one spectrum or you could do it individually on two separate blow-ups. You want to blow up the region of the Hb proton and the H, um, Hb trans proton, Hb cis proton, and then you want to relabel your peaks in hertz so that you can calculate coupling constants. Okay, so that's something I showed you last week in the demo with Topspin of how to get the hertz in the peak labels but leave your axis in parts per million. This is where you need it is experiment 17, okay? So you're going to want to calculate those coupling constants that you got then from your NMR data and you want to draw the splitting trees directly above those peaks on the NMR data. So make sure when you're processing you keep in mind for HB cis and trans and HA cis and trans you have to draw the splitting trees directly above those peaks so leave yourself room for that. Okay. So then if we look <coughs> at our HA protons <coughs> Those are going to be closer together, and the way we tell them uh, the difference between them is this initial coupling, 11.5 hertz versus 15.7 hertz. So this is the trans, this is the cis. <coughs> and you're still, just like with the HBs, you're going to blow up this region, label the peaks in hertz, your axis in parts per million, calculate the actual coupling constants, and then show the splitting trees above each proton. Okay. Another thing that you're going to want to do is you want to figure out the ratio of cis to trans that you have in your final mixture, okay, in the final purified mixture, which may be a little bit off depending on what fractions you use for that purified mixture or not. The best way to do that is to use your HB protons because they are separated well from each other. You want to make sure you get individual integration of HB trans and HB cis so then you can calculate the ratio of trans to cis or cis to trans, whichever way you want to look at it. Okay, Make sure you just define your ratio. But you want that integration. All right. So make sure you have good integration between HB trans and HB cis and that can either be in the region on the blow ups that you use for um, calculating the coupling constants and drawing the splitting trees or do another blow up where you just get that integration. Then you want to analyze, you still need to look at your entire spectrum for your um, experiment 17 product. So this is what the the entire spectrum looks like for the entire for experiment 17. And that's why you don't want any extra peaks in here because you already have a lot of peaks in there. Okay? You don't want to add anything extra in there. Um, so you need to have your um, spectrum between about um, minus half a ppm to about eight, eight and a half ppms. And you want the regular labeling that you had from last week, so that you can't see these very well, but these are all labeled <coughs> in parts per million. The top is parts per million. The axis is parts per million. We show our integration on here. And then you're going to draw the structure of your compound and go through and label um, all of the protons as they correspond to <coughs> the structure of your compound. Okay. Keep in mind in making these assignments, you have cis product and you have trans product in there. Okay. So you saw the difference between the cis and trans protons. You probably will see differences with the rest of the, of the compound <coughs> as well, at least part of it. All right. So you have to draw your structure on here. You may want to draw a cis structure and a trans structure. Make sure to label everything with letters. Remember what is HA and what is HB. Okay. Keep HA and HB the same and then label all the other protons with other letters. Label the peaks with those letters. And then you're going to need an NMR <coughs> table um, like we described in um, each individual lab section, what you need to put in there. So for this experiment, you have literature chemical shifts. You're going to calculate chemical shifts. Or sorry, you have experimental chemical shifts. You have calculated chemical shifts. There is no literature spectrum for the product you're making. Okay, So there's no literature chemical shifts. 
you'll probably need integration, multiplicity, and then don't forget you also have calculated a bunch of coupling constants. So make sure that those are included. And in your notebook, make sure you show the calculations of the chemical shifts and um, the calculations for your coupling constants as well as your yield. Yes? So when we print out these um, MR spectra, you want the PPM for the zoomed out one, you want the zoomed in to be in hertz for the peaks? Right. So we'll for the top the label, but still keep your axis always in parts per million. Okay. Yeah, so full spectrum, parts per million, parts per million. The zoomed in portions of HA protons and HB protons, so that you can calculate coupling constants and draw splitting trees, will be hertz and then parts per million. And then you probably will need to zoom in on other portions of the um, spectrum as well to be able to make assignments. And those you, you can just do in parts per million, parts per million. Okay? Questions at all with this before I show you another table I've posted on Moodle for you? Okay, so on Moodle, I have posted these two data tables. One's for proton NMR, one's for carbon NMR. This is from a paper um, that was published in 1997 in um, Journal of Organic Chemistry, where a group went through and analyzed all of these common so, um, impurities that you find in NMR spectrum, okay? And so the impurities are labeled here on the left. The solvents, the NMR solvents that they use for the analysis are at the top. So most common to us is chloroform. So things that you might want to be aware of, water, it tells you where water comes from, or um, what chemical shift water has in chloroform, acetone, <coughs> vacuum grease, other common impurities that you may find in your NMR data and may have already been present in your experiment 18 NMR data, okay? So use this to help identify impurities that might be in your spectrum. Same with, um, we use hexane and ethyl acetate for the column for experiment 17 you might have residual hexane and ethyl acetate. So you'd look up ethyl acetate, see where those chemical shifts are. You'd look up hexane and see where those chemical shifts are. One warning in using this table, make sure if you are labeling an impurity as such and you want to identify, do your best to identify the impurity, make sure it makes sense, okay? So if you um, think you have a, um, some impurity around like 5.30 in your um, spectrum, which also happens to be where dichloromethane's chemical shifts fall. If you didn't use dichloromethane, if there's no reason for dichloromethane to have been in your sample, don't label it as dichloromethane because that doesn't make sense. It just, they coincidentally have the same chemical shift, okay? So use this as a useful resource, but be careful not to get crazy labeling impurities that are not impurities, or labeling them incorrectly. 